Today at the National Press Club, the creators of the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement, Patrice Kalor and Rodney Tavirlis, began their activism in 2013. And since then, the movement's gone global. Joining them is Jackie Huggins for a local perspective on why Black Lives Matter. Well, hello and welcome to the National Press Club here in Canberra for today's Westpac Address. I'm Misha Schubert, a Director and Vice President of the Club, and it's my honour to be in the chair today to introduce our speakers and to facilitate our Q&A with members of the National Press Club. Today we bring you a special event, one that looks at issues of race and circumstance in our time. With us today are one of the founders of the one of the US founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, the lead organizer from the movement's Canadian chapter, and one of the Australia's most distinguished Indigenous leaders. But before I introduce them and today's forum in more detail, I begin, as we do in this land, by acknowledging the traditional owners of country. Not far from where this club stands, ancient rock art at Birigai and Tidbinbilla and in the Namadji National Park reminds us that this country the land on which Canberra and its surrounds are built has been home to the first Australians for at least 21,000 years. And the timeline of the first Australians across this vast continent as a whole spans some 65,000 years and counting. Our country is home to the oldest living cultures on the planet and the custodians and tra traditional owners who guard it. So we pay our respects to the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and indeed to all the traditional owners across the country in areas where our broadcast reaches. And we honour your elders and ancestors, that long line of custodians stretching back across thousands of generations who have kept law and language and culture alive in this place since time immemorial. Today we'll hear from three distinguished speakers on why black lives matter everywhere. And if you would like to join in the conversation online, you can do so using our hashtag NPC and our Twitter handle at Press Club Ost. Please don't be shy. We love to have people be part of this discussion from home and in our broadcast footprint. To begin and to offer some crucial local context, we will hear from one of the co-chairs of the Congress of Australia's First Peoples, Dr Jackie Huggins AM. And I must say it's always a huge honour to share a stage with Jackie, whose work and leadership I have admired over a lifetime. Jackie is, of course, a Bidjara Birigabajura woman from Queensland. She is an historian, a leader and an advocate, and a person who has devoted more than four decades of her life to public service for our nation. Her roles have included serving as co-commissioner for the inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, roles with the National Treasure that is the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. She served on the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation as a co-chair of Reconciliation Australia and on the Telstra Foundation. She must be tired with all of that commitment. <laughs> but with the Royal Commission into the protection and detention of children in the Northern Territory, a commission sparked by the Dondale allegations due to hand down its findings in just over a fortnight on November 17. It feels especially timely to have Jackie address us today. And then we will, of course, hear from our two distinguished international speakers who are in Australia this week to accept the Sydney Peace Prize for 2017. The prize is being conferred on the Black Lives Matter movement tomorrow night in Sydney, I believe, and we thank the Sydney Peace Prize for sharing their distinguished talent with us at this occasion. We will hear from Patrice Cullors, one of the three American women who founded this movement in 2013. You'll recall that it began with the events in Sanford, Florida that year. A man named George Zimmerman was found not guilty of the murder of a 17-year-old boy. His name was Trayvon Martin. The outcry that followed those events sparked the hashtag Black Lives Matter, under which one of the biggest grassroots movements in the United States then took shape and now has become a global movement. Patrice is an artist, an actor, a theatre maker, a Fulbright scholar and an NAACP history maker. Again, a woman with a very long and distinguished biography. And I love this, among her many civil honours, the Los Angeles Times named her civil rights leader for the 21st century and Glamour magazine made her its 2016 Woman of the Year, which is quite the uh, uh, du 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 duopoly. <laughs> She has a degree in religion and philosophy from the University of California in Los Angeles, and she's a founder of the Coalition to End Sheriff Violence, her not-for-profit not for Dignity and Power Now, and was instrumental in establishing Los Angeles' first civilian oversight commission over the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Patrice, welcome to the National Press Club of Australia, and thank you for being here today. 
And to complete this formidable lineup, our third speaker will be Rodney Deverlis. In 2014, Rodney co-founded Black Lives Matter Toronto, the first international iteration of the Black Lives Matter movement globally, and he's now the lead Canadian organiser with the Global Network. Rodney's a community organiser, a dancer and a choreographer, a curator, and among his many governance and public service contributions are roles as Secretary for the Ontario Youth Line, as Vice President Equity and President of the Ryerson Students' Union, and as Chairperson of the Palin Foundation. I'm assuming that's not connected to Sarah Palin, but I could be wrong. <laughs> he was a commissioner. <laughs> More on that later. He was a commissioner with the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario. Rodney, we bid you a warm welcome also, and we look forward to hearing you speak. So let's begin. Would you please welcome to the stage Dr. Jackie Huggins? Thank you very much, Misha. And uh, I will also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on uh, whose land we were gathered, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. And I also want to acknowledge my Indigenous brothers and sisters uh, in the audience as well. Um, well, wow, what, what a pleasure it is and a privilege it is today to be on the panel uh, uh, with the founders of the Black Lives Matter. We have followed you. We have felt every pain, every word that you make, and it's really wonderful that you've come to our country. The Black Lives Matters movement, as we know, emerged in the United States of America and in Canada, following the alarming number of deaths of people of colour at the hands of police. Deaths that were often entirely unnecessary and that were conducted largely with impunity by officials of the state. The outrage among the community that follows these tragic circumstances and deaths is not just because of the unnecessary and senseless loss of valued members of their family and community. It is also because these deaths are inevitable and they don't have to be that inevitable as a result of a system that historically and to this day perpetuates oppression, segregation and institutional and systemic bias against people of colour. It's the very real feeling that the lives of some communities just don't matter as much as the lives of others. A justice system that is meant to protect us all and to ensure that we are all equal under the law is in fact a justice system that reaps injustice on the people that they serve and communities of colour. As an Aboriginal leader, I know that the Black Lives Matter movement has resonated with many, many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Australia. Our history, colonisation, dispossession, separation, assimilation and the failed attempts to destroy our culture means that we all feel very much the same, that our lives as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are treated as less than and less valued by the systems and the institutions that are supposed to support and protect us. That our valuable place as the First Nations peoples who have survived and thrived on these lands for over 40,000 years means nothing. In the context of Australia, this historical and continuing experience also manifests itself most obviously in our justice system. Many people know about the mass incarceration of people of colour in the United States of America, but most aren't aware that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the most incarcerated in the world. And this is happening within our own country. We make up less than 3% of the Australian population, but we are more than 25% of the prison population. While the causes of crime and imprisonment are complex and varied, what we do know is that the underlying causes of crime are poverty and disadvantage, which are often ex exacerbated by a system and institutions such as the police and the courts, 
that act to further the detriment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I want here to specifically mention Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, our mothers, sisters, nurturers and leaders of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. They make up 33% of the female population in the prison and today are the fastest growing prison population. 90% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women in prison have been victims of violence or sexual assault, and 80% of them are mothers torn away from their families and from their children. 26 years ago, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody clearly documented that the justice system has been stacked against us right from the beginning. While progress to implement the Royal Commission's 339 recommendations has been far too slow. At this current point in time, we are at a critical juncture for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And as we've heard, uh, the uh, uh, Royal Commission into uh, the detention centres uh, in the Northern Territory and our children uh, in, in prison are uh, it's about to become uh, a reality. And we know that 50% of the population of uh, those youth are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. People, this is a national disgrace in our country. And we welcome the uh, Black Lives Matters to, I hope, show some light and uh, give us strength in terms of the struggles that we pursue in the very high incarceration of our people in prison. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I really, really appreciate the honor. Uh, once again, my name is Patrice Cullors. I'm one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, the global network. Um, and I'd like to start also by honoring the traditional owners of this land, both past and present. Um, this is a historical moment, and I think uh, black people uh, from time have been meeting globally to discuss our plight and to make decisions about how we resist. I wanna tell you all the story of Black Lives Matter. I wanna tell you its origins, its beginnings. In 2013, George Zimmerman was acquitted of the murder of Trayvon Martin. Alicia Garza wrote a love note to black people and she penned it, uh, Black Lives Matter. I saw that love note, I saw the strength in Black Lives Matter and put a hashtag on it. Within a couple of days, her, myself, and Opal Tometi decided that we wanted to build a new political platform for black people. Uh, a platform that could really look at the impact anti-black racism was having not just inside the US, but also across the globe. And then August 9th happened. August 9th of 2014, Mike Brown was killed by Darren Wilson. He was left on the co concrete of Ferguson, Missouri, Missouri for four and a half hours. He was left to bleed out, not just in front of his entire community, but his mother, his father, and his stepfather. The community pled, they pleaded, and they, they called for uh, the Ferguson Police Department to show them their child, um, to tell them why this was happening to them. And instead of responding um, with care, instead of responding with grace, the Ferguson Police responded with rubber bullets and tear gas. And what we would witness for months after the killing of Mike Brown was the denigration of the black communities in Ferguson, but also denigration of the black communities that rose up across the country and across the world. Black Lives Matter has become what black communities all over the world have needed it to become. It's a hashtag. At other moments, it's a declaration. It's a cry of rage, a sharing of light. It has become a movement that is international, worldwide in its scope of liberation of black people and oppressed people everywhere. 
We have over 40 chapters officiated in North America, including Canada and the United Kingdom, and several in, de in development around the world. Black Lives Matter is a growing global movement. We've seen other movements arise during the last four years. An immigrant rights movement, a women's march movement, queer and trans folks have taken to the street, a take a knee movement really built by Colin Kaepernick, who was a quarterback in our country and has been um, essentially blackballed by the NFL. And we've also seen the rise of white supremacists. We've seen the rise of white nationalism. We've seen the impact that's had on communities like Charlottesville, the impact that's had on communities like Boston and Baltimore. And Black Lives Matter warned us. We said if we don't fight now, we are going to see issues, the same issues that we're seeing today. And as I'm here in this country, as I was on my way to the press club this morning, I couldn't help but reflect on the experience and conversations I've been having with indigenous peoples, South Sea Islanders and Torres Strait Islanders, the horrendous stories steeped in state violence and government cover-ups, stories about children being harassed by cops and dying being murdered in jail cells. I recognize the history here is brutal and has a racist colonial past one that sometimes mirrors the US. But it would be easy to only talk about the past. Let's not make this an easy conversation today. Let's be courageous about what is happening right here and in my country, where the communities most marginalized in Australia face the highest rates of poverty, infant mortality, and incarceration. Let's talk about the impact the years of the stolen generation has had on current day Australia the trauma, trauma and the spectacle of having our entire lives obliterated before us, a trauma that tears into our spirits and our psyches more like a nightmare with very little reprieve. We stand here today as, a black, as our Black Lives Matter global network committing to be a part of the long legacy of global black struggle and solidarity with indigenous people of Australia. South Sea Islanders and Torres Strait Islanders. And we urge this local government, as we have urged our local government, to heed the demands of these communities. We have been told this government has been silent and instead has chosen to watch, often perpetuate, and be bystanders to the atrocities black people face. We, black people, we've been courageous. Our ancestors have been courageous. We need you, elected officials, appointed officials, and journalists. It's your turn to be courageous. We need you to make a choice to heal this country. We need you to believe, to listen to the community in Australia. Because silence, that's the silence that often gives way to more murder. That's the silence that often gives way to more disadvantages. But for those of us who experience this type of devastation every single day, we don't have a choice. When everyone else fares, fails to carry the weight with us, their complicitness in benefiting from anti-black racism, their refusal to name anti-black racism, the erasure of our devastation, we are expected to carry that failure, to carry their inability to recognize that freedom for us means freedom for everyone. We must say the names of those who have fallen because it's those names that teach us, remind us how we win. That is why our movement is here today. That is why we have chosen to come 14,000 kilometers. We don't use that system in the US, but I'm going to use it here. And we have to recognize and build non-colonial ways that help us bridge the gap. Our movement is built by all of us. It is our duty to join the growing movement for justice inside of this country and outside of this country. If you don't see yourself as an active participant in the liberation of black people, now is your opportunity. All of our lives depend on it. Ashe. It's always fantastic to have to follow two great speakers. What a, what a thrill. 
Uh, thank you to everyone for having us here. Uh, my name is Rodney. I am an artist, an activist, uh, working and living in Turtle Island, uh, specifically uh, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations uh, land, what you would know as Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, I also want to thank the indigenous peoples of this land, the original caretakers of this land, uh, folks who have allowed us through their labor and through their work to come here and to work and to, uh, to be and to exist, uh, specifically the Aboriginal, the Torres Strait Islander and South Sea Islander folks who have welcomed us here as well this week. Thank you. So in November 2014, uh, I received a Facebook message from Sandy Hudson. Uh, and in that message thread were Jenea Khan, Pascal de Verlis, Yusra Kogali, and other black organizers, activists, cultural producers in Toronto. What we knew was that the grand jury verdict for Darren Wilson for the murder of Mike Brown uh, was expected to come in. As you may remember, and as, uh, as Patrice said, Mike Brown was an unarmed teenager in Ferguson, Missouri, shot and killed in his back and left to die in his neighborhood. The message thread was created with a pretense of what do we do? We knew a number of, of scenarios and cases, both locally and globally, of police killings, but we didn't know what to do. We decided to stay in contact and organize something. We didn't know what that would look like. And in November 24th, 2014, we sat together and watched the no indictment decision come in. That was on live TV. We sat, we were numb, we were silent, we were angry, and we knew that at this moment forward, that there was something in all of us to be done. We organized initially what was to be a rally in front of the US consulate. Uh, in a cold Canadian uh, ice rain day, 4,000 people came out, 24 hour notice, and we knew that this was the beginning of something. We knew that Black Lives Matter as a hashtag, as a movement, resonated with people in our community. And we knew that it was important that we addressed from the Canadian context some of the very similarities that are addressed in the US. Now, in Canada, we, we share the border with the US. And the reality is that often we're lost in the shadows of the US. Most people can articulate, uh, can articulate the, the, the violence that happens in the United States, but most people don't even really know that there are black folks in Canada as well. <laughs> At the time of Mike Brown, there was a man named Jermaine Carby, who was a Toronto man also killed by the police. Same exact timeline. He was killed in a routine traffic stop. Where have you heard that before? And we knew that it was time to create a local hub for black organizing, a local hub for black resistance, a local hub for black militancy. Over the last three years of work, Black Lives Matter in Canada has worked to create an umbrella movement for the diverse communities of black folks to live and to thrive. Blackness is very diverse in Canada. We know there are folks that are traditionally uh, from the land. We have folks that are descendants of enslaved folks. We have people that, are, uh, that moved in from the early 1900s that moved in through the domestic worker scheme of the 1960s, that are new migrants after the 1990s civil war in Somalia, that are new migrants from all over the continent, from Haiti, Jamaica, Somalia, Congo, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Trinidad and Tobago, Kenya, Sudan. We have First Nations folks, Inuit folks, Métis folks. In our work over the last three years, it was to dispel the myth of Canadian benevolence we are known internationally as the champion of human rights, and yet in our own country, all across the board, whether it's in incarceration, racial profiling, employment, education, access to services, black and Canada's indigenous and First Nations people often share the number one and two spots. The one in, number one and two spots looks like 70% more black folks in federal prisons over the last 10 years, 50% more indigenous people. It looks like black folks being 3% of the population but make up over 10% of the prison population. Indigenous folks making up 4% of the population but making up 24.4% of the prison population. Where have you heard that before? We knew of formerly enslaved black Canadians, many of whom were shipped to Nova Scotia, who on this day have still not yet received the, le the deeds to the lands that they were promised. We know that the Canadian police too have the blood of black Canadians on their hands, from Jermaine Carby to Andrew Loku to Mark Kemba to Samaya Dalmar. We know of school police officers handcuffing six-year-olds in class for behavioral issues. 
As part of this work, we recognize that the plight of black folks globally and the plight of black folks in Canada, we are not individual in, this, in these scenarios. BLM leaders have traveled all over the globe to meet with black folks in the US, in Canada, the Americas, the continent of Africa, the UK, the Netherlands, Europe, and now Australia. And what I can tell you for certain are two things. Anti-blackness, state-sanctioned violence, anti-black racism are global phenomenons. Wherever you go where you see black folks, anti-blackness exists. And all across the globe, black folks are hurting. The systems are failing us. Our governments are not intervening. There is a lack of awareness even amongst our own communities of the experiences that happen. Where have you heard that before? The second thing is that black folks are all over the globe resisting. BLM, as we've alluded to, is a global network. What you've probably seen in the news are often a lot of the specific local context in the US, but BLM is a global network. We are an umbrella. We are a political home for black folks all across the globe to engage in protests and resistance, collective organizing, collect community healing spaces. We are online platforms. We are a hashtag. We are a belief system. We are a way of life. Over the last uh, week, we've had a chance to, to tour around a couple of spots in, in, in Australia and uh, really have heard on the experiences and the realities of Aboriginal, of Torres Strait Islander, and South Sea Islander folks in this country. We went to Mildura and heard from service providers that were providing uh, direct services to victims of, of violence. We had a yarning circle in Redfern in which we heard of the number of uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, and, and Torres Strait Islander and South Sea Islander folks here who have died in police custody. We've heard of David Dungai in 2015 who was murdered and held down by six police officers. We heard from Margaret Hall whose son died just last year. We heard from Eddie Murray, uh, Murray Murray's sister, uh, who Eddie Murray died on December 6, 1981. We know that the incarceration rates are disproportionate. We know about the cycle of oppression, the lack of access to services, poverty and disenfranchisement, the justice system that just doesn't work for us. Across the board, it's the same story over and over and over again. We've heard of the statistics, the 2.5% of the population, but over 25% of the incarceration rate. The over 99 uh, unsolved murders in custodies, the fight for recognition, so many similarities between our countries. And we think that this is a particularly exciting time because black folks across the globe are now sharing. We're sharing resources, we're sharing tools, we're sharing uh, organizing tactics. We are coming together to recognize that as our governments and as our countries suppress us, we have a global obligation to support our own people. We are organizing our communities. We are fighting for self-determination. We are mobilizing and taking to the streets. We are building an intergenerational movement never seen before. This is not your grandparents' movement. This is a movement of the now. One that is intersectional and fights for all black lives. Black queer lives, trans lives, black women lives, black disabled lives, indigenous lives, migrants. We are energetic, we are vibrant, we are militant, we are unapologetic, we are unconventional. We are online and in the physical. We work inside the systems, outside the systems, all around. We recognize and are thankful for the Sydney Peace Foundation for honoring a movement. This is the first time that they've honored a movement. And we recognize that although it's myself, Patrice, and Dawn from our Long Beach chapter that are here to accept this prize, that it actually honors the tireless work of thousands of black folks who have been organizing and mobilizing for black life across the globe. This prize recognizes the impacts of our people have had on the global fight against anti-black racism and the incredible contribution our movement leaders have had in their local communities and social political landscape. But beyond this prize, we want to throw it to you all, the people of Australia. What will you do beyond this week? What will you do in your spheres? What will we all do when we go back home to address anti-blackness? The role of challenging anti-black racism and anti-blackness is not left only to black folks. It is up to all of us. This is all of our problems. We all have to fix it. We need to remember that this is a moment. This is not a movement. We are young. We are standing on the shoulders of our giants. But we recognize that this uh, is, uh, sorry, this is a movement, not a movement. We are here, we are here, we are here, and we ain't going nowhere. Thank you.
Well, we'll now move to our period of questions and answers, and thank you each for your framing and opening remarks. I wondered if I might kick off by asking each of you whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about progress uh, in the course of history, uh, thinking about those stories you've told us, thinking about, um, I think as Pat uh, Patrice expressed so elegantly, that desire for authorities to respond with care and grace in those moments. Um, are you optimistic or pessimistic in our time? Do you want to start? I'd love to hear from you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am optimistic. Uh, generally, um, I'm optimistic. Obviously, I have my days where I'm deeply disturbed. I live under uh, the Trump administration. So it's a scary moment inside of my country um, for all of us, honestly. Uh, but this is just a blip in history. And I'm reminded about um, some of the more scarier moments in my country, um, the uh, moments of the uh, Chateau slavery, mm -hmm. and uh, that our folks found a way out of that. Um, and I think we can find a way out of this mess. And so I deeply believe as much as, as, much as, as there's conflict and hurt and pain, I deeply believe in uh, black people's ability to uh, fight for our resilience. Um, and uh, for our ability to be some of the most creative and innovative people under the most extreme circumstances. So uh, I have a lot of um, optimistic uh, optimism inside of me. I think as an organizer, um, uh, you have to be a little bit crazy to do this work, um, to, to believe that you can um, undo hundreds of years of colonialism, but um, if we didn't believe it, um, then who's going to fight for us? Yeah, I think you have to be. I think that um, it, it's when you when we're so used to, to seeing our people dying, you know, watching videos of, of people in their cars, walking in the streets, uh, dying. You have to be optimistic that there's there's something that can be done. Um, in addition to all of the rage, in addition to the resistance that we do, we do an incredible amount of community healing and community work. And part of that is about envisioning what is our alternative and what is our future. Uh, so in addition to thinking about how we can uh, change and, 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 uh, and modify the current conditions, we also have to be envisioning what kind of world we want to live in, what kind of world do we want for our children and grandchildren. And uh, those are the things that I, I keep me going. Uh, otherwise, I would just want to be in a corner making art, ignoring the rest of the world, because it, it sometimes is quite daunting that sometimes optimism is the only thing, the only thing you have. And for me, of course, after 40 years, I'm still pretty optimistic, mm -hmm. but uh, I get very saddened, of course, and uh, in terms of everyday life for our people, uh, the poverty, the despair, but also, you know, I look to the future and, and look at our young people who are being educated every single day. Um, uh, some, of course, uh, will not have the opportunity to uh, have the kind of uh, privileged lifestyle that um, some of us do enjoy in our country and, and stay stuck. Um, however, I think without that optimism and hope for the future, um, you know, there is, uh, uh, it's a driver, I believe, a motivation that keeps us going. Very fittingly, our first question from working journalists mm -hmm. comes from uh, an NITV journalist, the National Indigenous Television uh, Station, and it's Nakari Thorpe. Hi, Nakari Thought from NITV. Thank you so much for your address. It's great to hear from you all. Um, I wondered about the concerns from the Indigenous community here about campaigns in regards to black deaths in custody, suicide, family violence, um, and you know, obviously they've been fighting for that for a long time. Um, and here, the mainstream media audiences don't pick it up. How, why do you think this movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, has garnered so much attention and led to this uh, global movement? Why do you think campaigns here don't have that same visibility? And in terms of First Nations, you might have mentioned it already, but um, where do they fit into this movement? And no doubt they're subject to the same injustices. Um, I don't need to bring this close to me, do I? Everybody can hear me? Okay. Um, so, a, a few things. I think 
uh, the context in the U.S., um, it's important to understand that many of us are the generation that grew up um, during the war on drugs and the war on gangs. We're the generation that witnessed our communities be over-policed, over-incarcerated. We're the generation that um, see, saw our family members be ripped from each other um, by, by the state, um, by um, um, ICE, immigrant um, detention. Um, we are the generation who uh, have been um, forgotten and the generation who has uh, not had access to employment. Um, and so all of this happens and um, the U.S. Um, neighborhoods, mostly working class poor neighborhoods, become um, a hotbed. And uh, what we saw specifically in Ferguson is um, the thing that was different from, say, even Trayvon Martin, is the community of Ferguson didn't go back and don't go back home. They stayed in the streets. There was a, a literal uprising. And um, the first night that folks um, uh, were outside and and you know really grieving for Mike Brown, they did a vigil. They didn't go outside and start rioting and looting. They went outside to grieve. And the, the, the police response was a military response. And they rubber bulleted people. They tear gassed people. And uh, that didn't deter the people of Ferguson to um, go back home. And I think um, as many of us watched on social media, I mean, that's how I learned about Mike Brown, was because his stepfather had a sign that said, someone just killed my child. A cop just killed my child, come help me. And that's actually how the community heard about it. Uh, and, and for many of us, black folks across the country, it struck a chord in us because one of our family members had been brutalized by the police, one of our family members had been killed by the police, one of our family members had been humiliated and denigrated by the state. And um, it, it was almost like a guttural pull. And so many of us showed up to Ferguson. We didn't just sit in our homes, we showed up right there. And I think there was this need to feel um, not just um, to show up to, to, to just to be there, but it felt like it was a necessary step to be in solidarity. And as we showed up, there was, there was two things that we said to each other, um, but pretty explicitly, one of the things was, um, we are here to be in solidarity with the community of Ferguson, but the second thing, which I think is much more important, is Ferguson is not an aberration. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a Ferguson in LA, there's a Ferguson in Baltimore, there's a Ferguson in Oakland and New York and Chattanooga, Tennessee. Ferguson is literally everywhere that black people are. And we understood that it was, this was a moment, it was a spark for us to galvanize ourselves, to show up for black people in a very particular way. And so that's, I think that was, that was our moment. That was our moment to, it was either then or never. And we took it very seriously. Uh, and I think, uh, I can't really speak to why um, it's not galvanizing in the same way here, but I will tell you this, we forced the media to look at us. Um, we, we utilized disruption just like the civil rights movement did and the human rights movement did in the 60s and 70s. We showed up in the streets. We showed up at police stations and occupied police stations. We put our bodies on the line because we were sick and tired of of, of law enforcement and media not listening to us. So they literally had to document what was happening um, because we, we made them document. Um, and then I think for the piece around um, the First Nations people stateside in particular, uh, we have uh, been developing a deep relationship with uh, communities throughout the U.S., indigenous communities, but I would say specifically when No Dapple happened, the Dakota Access Pipeline, Black Lives Matter was invited to come in uh, to uh, be in relationship with some of the indigenous leaders, a lot of the young, younger folks, and sit and be in conversation about how we build a deeper relationship. Um, and since then, folks across the country have been uh, building out what we see as Black Lives Matter You know, began as a movement in 2013, but we see it as an intersectional movement in which we have really um, uh, seen lots of mov movements emerge from it. And so we're in deep relationship with indigenous communities across the U.S. and, and I think specifically um, taking their lead when it comes to what they see as some of the most important fights uh, and that, that would be climate change in particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, I think that 
one thing that I find in terms of similarities between Canada and Australia is this belief, you know, there's often in our countries, people can articulate what's happening in the States, but might not necessarily know that it's happening in our same country. We experienced this within the first year of our, of our chapter development. Um, there were many times that we had to kind of keep saying the names of local people over and over and over again. And even the people that were in our own communities were like willing to, you know, to, to show up for a solidarity action for an American, but not for a Canadian, right? The numbers would be drastic. And for us, it was actually important to just be persistent. Um, you know, our first uh, actions, if you look at the media, if you do a media landscape or an, a, a, a landscape of what was happening um, uh, in our communities, um, that it took us actually being persistent. It took us being out, um, not only out in the streets, um, but we were out and everywhere. At first, we were just seen as oh, just those loud, ruckus kids, right? That are that are that are agitating, that are blockading uh, highways, that are being a nuisance. Um, but really, by, by by proliferating, what we saw is all aspects of the political landscape. So not only on the streets, but we were out. We were, you know, whether we were physically there or not, we 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 had our presence out at policy tables. We were out uh, in municipal affairs, provincial affairs, and federal affairs. We kind of had to say whether or not you wanted to handle or deal with us, we're still going to be here. Um, and in the piece around the relationship with First Nations folks, I think that we, we are very clear and intentional in the way that we build relationships with our indigenous community, recognizing uh, that the colonial project in Canada and the US and many places in the States, uh, in many places in the world, the colonial project was twofold. In Canada specifically, the first step was erasure was let's actually clear the land, let's get, and I'm going to be very crass about this, but it was let's, let, is, let us clear the land, take the land, and, and let erase people, literally remove people. Populations have dwindled. And the second fold was let's import people in to work. So we recognize that that, 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 that that dual purpose of the colonial project has trickled down to even now, where before, you know, movements in the past um, have have almost fought for scraps. A government program will say, we're, giving, we're gonna give funding to support this community. And as I've mentioned before, black and indigenous folks often toggle between number one and number two worst. So it would be, you know, we'll, we'll do this policy, but it'll be for indigenous folks. We'll do funding, but it'll be for black folks. But never was there ever really a conversation about the ways that we need support together. And our movement is very intentional in ensuring that when we are out seeking justice, when we're out uh, asking for change, that part of that conversation is about what we all need together. Um, we support each other's work. We are actively building, um, um, we're actively not just in working in solidarity, but building deep movement relationships. Uh, when we have actions, folks come out and put their bodies on the line, and vice versa as well. Uh, I think that, you know, the exciting thing also about this time is that we recognize that. Um, or in terms of organizing and activism, that we don't have to actually play by the rules that are given to us, that we can actually create our own rules. We can create our own, we don't, we don't, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't need to write a, a, press, a press release that's sent out to Newswire. We're just gonna go and, ha and, and, and shut down a highway and do our own media. Like there, we've, we've really figured, we've really experimented with the different ways that we can, um, re we can change things up and experimenting with the different ways that we can show up for each other in ways that are surprising and in ways that you might not expect. And uh, here in Australia, we have the Change the Record campaign, of which our two co-chairs are in the room, Antoinette Braybrook and Cheryl Axelby. Um, Change the Record, ca Record campaign is a campaign against the high rates of imprisonment rates in our country. It's a blueprint for change and for the violence against uh, Aboriginal women and children. And uh, they work very hard, uh, in much in solidarity um, uh, with our organisations across the country, and uh, yet, you know, they're our, uh, they would probably be the closest to uh, what we have here uh, in Australia to Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Sure. Our next question comes from the host of the uh, flagship current affairs show on ABC Radio of the morning, Sabra Lane. Hello all, and a question for each of you. Thank you so much for talking us to us today. Jackie Huggins, I want to um, follow up from the events of last week, the government rejecting the voice to parliament. There's now going to be a joint committee, go back through all the reviews that have been held to come up with uh, a new recommendation. What is the, the danger there that Indigenous communities say, we don't accept that, we've told you 
what we would like and we're now not going to accept what Parliament's going to tell us. Mm. Patrice, you disappointed that more wasn't achieved under President Obama. And uh, Rodney, hey, Commonwealth, mm -hmm. Canada, Australia, yeah. we've got a lot in common. Yeah. 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 Uh, this government's really, um, you know, there's been the idea of justice targets to try and set goals to get the numbers of people down in prison uh, with Indigenous Australians. Are there any lessons from Canada that um, Australia can follow? Oh, over to me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Sabra, for the triple barrel question. That's, that's great. Look, let me answer the, in this way. You asked me about the Uluru Statement, and uh, yes, uh, uh, Patrick Dodson has described it, and others have described it as a kick in the guts. Um, we know that uh, uh, Pat Anderson has called the Prime Minister of Australia a mission manager. Um, so the depth of um, uh, disappointment and anger is very much out there. Um, what we're doing from National Congress point of view uh, uh, are working with uh, the Social Justice Commissioner, uh, with the Uluru uh, Statement Working Group, who had been elected from uh, the Uluru Convention, in uh, keeping this alive and keeping it on the, on, on the table, uh, because uh, whilst uh, the Prime Minister has said uh, he will not entertain a referendum on our recognition within the Constitution. Um, we still have the Makarata uh, Truth Telling Commission and treaties that uh, will be uh, still talked about and will be talked about for decades, I would, su I would suspect, until uh, you know, something uh, drastic uh, happens. Uh, under the Close the Gap as well, um, the Close the Gap refresh, we've asked for um, national justice targets. To, um, uh, to bring down the uh, high rates of imprisonment. Uh, we feel that there's an opportunity now that whilst the, um, uh, the government is consulting across the country to raise those because they, they with child protection and also housing targets, are uh, some of the very real things that we can uh, still move forward. But look, we haven't stopped there. Um, we've uh, had a no from the Prime Minister around constitutional reform, but uh, we will keep going with our very pressing issues, amongst them the very high incarceration rates of our people. Just before we get to Patrice and Rodney, Jackie, do you have a sense of why it failed at Cabinet? Um, no. What, what we believe uh, is that uh, this was a decision that was made when it wasn't even tested amongst the community out there. And as you know, Misha, I've been working in reconciliation all my life. And uh, I would have thought that there had been some better and uh, some Australians of goodwill. In fact, I've been rung up by more white people in this country expressing their disappointment than my own. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it, it's out there. And, and people, I think, are trying to see um, some truth telling, some justice and, and some dignity for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people after, after many, many years. So you want to know why I was? We were disappointed with Obama, or? Well, you're disappointed that more wasn't achieved under President Obama. Yes, um, yes, and we, you know, our movement started under the Obama administration, mm -hmm. and uh, we recognized a lot was at play during his administration. We recognized um, the consistent assault on the of the right on to him and and policies he was trying to pass, and we think that his administration could have done more and should have done more for black people, poor black people in particular. And um, we weren't shy about that. Uh, you know, we had many of conversations with him and his administration. And in fact, during the um, elections, um, we went after the D Democratic Party first because it was the party that was supposed to be the party for black people. Um, it's the party that we are most loyal to. And yet, um, historically, it's the party that has locked us up the most the party that uh, three strikes law was created, the party that allowed for the war on drugs to run rampant. And so uh, we made a decision as Black Lives Matter. We knew the Republican Party, that was easy. Um, it was the Democratic Party that we needed to show up differently. And I would say that in this current moment, um, part of the, and the outgrowth of the Black Lives Matter movement um, 
we have initiated an electoral justice table in which we are um, trying to figure out an experiment with uh, really positioning black people in local government and state government and in national government um, and not just any black people, um, but black folks who have, uh, are of our ideas. Um, and also, uh, we have uh, really developed uh, in, in, the, in the last couple of years um, some new insights around what might be possible in changing legislation that can actually hold law enforcement accountable um, and that can actually make black communities safer. Uh, I think that, you know, as I've mentioned, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm constantly um, excited about during this trip is to find out the similarities between our countries. Uh, not only are we on the Commonwealth, and we're known to be really nice champions of human rights globally. Uh, I believe that y'all just got a seat on the council, you know, on a human rights council. Um, I think that um, there are a couple of realities in, the, in this time in Canada that, um, that have made us respond in our organizing in a particular way. So one, we have a leader that is a stark opposition to 45. I mean, we have the, the leader that everyone wants, wall coiffed hair, he's real nice, he meets with you, he'll cry, he'll, he'll show up, he will do all the, he'll hit all the check marks that uh, any politician you'd want to do, except for actually doing work. Uh, and we also live in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a country, in a province and in a city that is just tired of consultations. We have a number of reports, we have a number of inquiries, we have a number of like th this thick 200 recommendation report on anything that you can think of under the sun relating to justice that sit on books that collect dust um, that, that that don't, that, don't, that don't really result in anything. Um, and often, whenever we're asking for something, whenever we're asking for a change, the government is quick to say, yeah, we are more than, we'll set up some community meetings, we'll set you up, we'll hear what's happening, but there's often no commitments, there's often no funding for those community meetings, uh, and we know that those are, those are things to use to, use to pacify our population. Um, I think that one, one of the things that we've realized in our strategies and tactics is we kind of have to be everywhere. There's often this age-old um, age critique of social movements, that social movements are uh, try to do too many things, and they have to be really streamlined in the work that we do. And I like to flip that on the other. Uh, I flip that around and think that we actually have to do everything. We have to be out on the streets. We have to be loud. We have to be disruptive. But we also have to be at the table. We have to be loud and disruptive there as well. We have to be in community, engaging with our people in our communities. We kind of have to, when we do campaigns or when we do initiatives, we hit them from all spheres. Uh, and we create as broad a coalitions as possible while still moving in a way that um, that is um, in line with our values, that is uh, still militant, and that still uh, pushes forward. Um, the last thing I, I would also say is that I moved to Canada. Um, I actually grew up in the States. So I moved to Canada uh, 12 years ago. Um, and so I was born in Haiti, raised in the States, two countries that have a big history of resistance. Um, if Haitians, first black republic in the world, uh, they are like naturally in our, in, our, in, our, in our blood, resistance runs through our blood. The US was a hotbed of just, a lot of stuff was happening. Moving to Canada, I feel like the, there's, um, there's this myth that Canadians actually can't, can't handle or have no interest in like radical militant culture. And for us, we kind of work to, to push and dispel that myth and thinking that we can actually push our societies um, much further than they want to go, if that makes sense. So that means, you know, looking at when we have our, our ask and our demands, there's obviously immediate demands. Change the material conditions right now and today. Change the, what's happening with policing. But it's all within a broader abolition framework. It's all within a broader framework that actually looks to an end goal of envisioning a world without the police, right? So there's a variety of different ways that we actually work to push people um, and I think that, you know, you, 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 what was the saying? You aim for the stars, you, you land on the moon. Uh, as social movements, we can, we can see where people are at, we can see where our societies are at, and push them a little bit further. And if, it, if, if, no, if nothing happens, if no one budges, at least we know that the conversation would have been put on the table, and at least we know that it's done in a way that gets, um, that gets, that gets people thinking about alternatives beyond the immediate, uh, the immediate tangible Band-Aid solutions that, um, that, uh, that are hard to come by. Yeah. 
We are rapidly racing the clock now towards the end of our session today, but we have time for two last questions. We're going to go to one of our school students um, immediately after this next question, but Sarah Martin is the political editor for the West Australian newspaper. And Hello, how question. are you? And thank you very much for the discussion today. I wanted to ask you about something that Jackie alluded to earlier, and that is the very high rates of family and domestic violence within Indigenous communities. and particularly bad in remote areas. If the policing and incarceration approach is failing to improve those statistics, what is the alternative and I guess how do you implement that while ensuring that children and women are safe? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think um, many of us inside the US are having a lot of conversations about um, the police being the interventionist for everything mm -hmm. and how that is a terrible mistake and yeah. um, that police are not trained and actually should not be trained to be social workers, mm -hmm. uh, should not be trained to be domestic violence counselors. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, they've proven to cause more harm and violence when coming into um, black communities in particular in the states. And so the question is, well, then what is the alternative? And uh, the conversations we've been having have been around a divestment and reinvestment framework, which is um, what has happened over the last 40 years is the government has completely divested from black communities, but they have invested into one thing, and that's police militarization and prisons. And so what we've seen um, in the last, I would say, decade is a, is a push and a challenge away from investing into prisons and incarceration and what we call community-based solutions. And um, what that looks like concretely, I'll kind of take it local focus in Los Angeles, um, we are looking at, uh, the, uh, the government is looking at building a new jail. It's going to cost them $3.5 billion. And the communities on the ground are saying that's um, ridiculous, that's excessive. In fact, here are all the ways that $3.5 billion can be utilized that supports families, children, um, and, and, and gives um, more space for care. Uh, I think we need to think, we need to talk about how our communities deserve care and what care actually looks like. A badge and a gun doesn't provide that. Um, but if we had uh, social workers, um, if we had more access um, to our communities being able to have um, intervention workers, um, there are amazing and brilliant ways that people have already been, um, without the money, um, utilizing uh, their communities to heal. And if they just were resourced, um, it would look very different. And so I think, uh, we need to start thinking about a different framework. Um, that framework needs to really call into question what our countries have invested their money in and their resources in and how we actually um, reorient our governments to um, divest from those places and reinvest into some of the most uh, poorest um, communities that are being uh, most impacted by violence. I I just want to add an echo to that. I think that um, it's about re re reframing the way that we understand violence, reframing and, and, and um, re a thinking from a particular vantage point of how does what actually leads to violence. To me, violence is actually a symptom of broader issues. There are issues around unemployment. There's issues around poverty. There's issues around mental health support. Um, we see oftentimes, as we said, our society is quick to, um, to support not only the militarization of police, but remove completely supports for communities, for people to be whole, healthy, happy uh, beings. And the reality of the situation is that um, it, to do supports or to give supports to people when, uh, when the symptoms are already uh, exacerbated, to give medical intervention, for example, if I'm using a metaphor, uh, if you're sick or if you're feeling sick, uh, you don't intervene when you get to the point where you're, 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 you're uh, in life support in a coma. You intervene early on. When I start to feel sick, and I've started to feel sick, mm -hmm. I've, I have taken some vitamin C, I've taken some akinesia, I've slept a little bit more, I've, I've treated holistically my entire body and my entire life uh, in a way that prevents me from getting to the point where I'm going to get sick. I think that we need to recognize that violence is a community disease. And I think it's time to recognize that we need to be addressing it from a holistic perspective. 
perspective and addressing it from, uh, from a preventative approach, from supporting folks to actually live thriving, healthy, economically stable, um, emotionally stable, uh, uh, free from PTSD, uh, psychologically supported lives. Uh, and I can, I can guarantee you if we see our governments investing in more of the proactive approaches, if we see our governments actually investing in people before things get out of hand, that will be able to ameliorate some of those issues. George, from Narrabunda College, where are you? Hi, okay. Hi um, just on behalf of everyone here uh, from the college, I'd like to say it's been an absolute pleasure having you speak um, today, being able to hear that. Um, Black Lives Matter has built a very powerful movement, uh, a grassroots movement through the use of social media. And although, in spite of that, Australia seems to lack a similarly powerful uh, grassroots movement of the same kind. Are there reasons why Australians have been unable to build a similarly successful movement with engagement across the wider community? Uh, I don't think it's necessarily our place to say that. We're not from here, we don't live here, we don't know the context. Um, and I've said this over the last couple of days because I think it's rude to come up to people's countries and tell them what to do or tell them what they haven't been doing. But what we can do is actually give you um, some insight at what we've done um, and how we've cultivated. Because trust and believe, four years ago, no one was talking about Black Lives Matter. That wasn't the co cultural context. In fact, everybody was like, guess what, guys? We got Obama. Racism's gone. That was the energy of the yeah. country. Yeah. And it was very difficult to have a conversation about racism, because literally the, the news was saying, is racism over? What does this mean? Most we have a black, society. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, there, there, isn't a, there isn't a magic fix to building a movement. Um, what I will say is we haven't given up. Um, what I will say is we've used disruption. And I said this in the United Kingdom before they started their Black Lives Matter movement and started using disruption. As I said, you guys, you know, they kept asking similar questions and I said, listen, the best thing that we knew how to do was show up and shut some down. That's what we did. Yeah. We went into the streets, we shut down buildings, we shut down highways, and we had targets. And we um, made the news come to us because they weren't. They weren't checking for us, they weren't looking at us. Um, many community members had lost loved ones at the hands of the, the police before that. Um, many folks had died in custody. Uh, it wasn't until young people said, um, yeah, we're not gonna take this anymore, we're tired. And uh, I think there's a breaking point. It's unfortunate, right? It's unfortunate, like we don't, I say this, I don't necessarily want to go into the middle of a highway. No. That's not my favorite thing no. to do. Not at all. But I do no. it because it's necessary. Yeah. I do it because it's a part of a larger, it's, a part, it's one tactic that's part of a larger strategy, which is liberation. And I, and I think, you know, uh, Australia has a long history of fighting and resistance. I know it's used disruption in the past. Maybe it'll use disruption um, in the future. But I know that has been, that was, you know, our, uh, that became uh, really important for us as we developed our movement. It was um, direct action and, and as a part of a legacy. Mm -hmm. Direct action has used in the 60s and the 70s, has been used in the 30s and the 40s in our country. It's a part of a long-standing um, history of how we resist. Mm -hmm. Do you want the very last word, Jack? Yes, look, I, I think that um, as a nation, still Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people um, have not been heard and not been respected in our country. Until that time comes, then we can work on all the things that will matter most and, and change us. We are right out of time, but would you please thank our panel for today?